Drive down I-95 today and pay attention to what your eyes catch without trying. You will notice cities keep showing up in a line. Richmond, Petersburg, Raleigh, Fayetteville, Columbia, Augusta. They sit inland, not on the beach and not deep in the hills. They are just far enough from the coast to feel different. Rivers pass through them and suddenly act strange. Smooth water turns rough. Calm flow turns loud and broken. You see rocks in the channel and fast current. It feels out of place because the land around looks gentle. No mountains or cliffs, just rolling ground. Yet the rivers behave like they hit a wall. People noticed this long before science had answers. Farmers, boat captains, and mill owners all saw it. Nobody could move boats past these spots easily. Goods piled up there and towns grew there. The mystery was simple. Why would rivers all change behavior at nearly the same distance from the ocean? Water is lazy and takes the easiest path. It shouldn't suddenly speed up for no reason. For a long time, there was no clear answer. Look at a map of the eastern United States right now. Many older cities form a rough north to south line. That line doesn't follow state borders. It cuts straight through them because nature ignores human lines. This line matches a change in the land under your tires. East of it, the ground is soft. It is made of sand, clay, and old sea mud packed together. West of it, the ground is hard. It formed deep underground under heat and pressure. Rivers flowing east had no trouble cutting through the soft ground. They carved wide, slow channels where boats floated easily. But when those same rivers reached the hard ground, everything changed. The riverbeds stopped wearing away as fast. The land stayed higher and water had to drop. Even a small drop matters. A drop of 20 feet is like a two-story building. That is enough to speed water up and make rapids that stop boats cold. This sharp change is called the fall line. It isn't a cliff you hike, but a boundary in the ground. You can see this today without special tools. Stand near the James River in Richmond and the water is loud. It breaks over rocks. A few miles downstream, the same river turns wide and calm. Engineers measured this change. On parts of the James, the river drops 14 feet per mile at the boundary. 14 feet is taller than a one-story house, spread over a mile, that creates steady rapids. Boats in the 1700s could not pass. Logs jammed and cargo spilled. People had to unload and wagons took over. Where wagons stop, towns appear. This happened over and over by force. At first, People blamed floods or bad luck. Some thought ancient storms carved those rough spots. But those ideas didn't explain why the pattern repeated on every major river from New Jersey to Georgia. That is over 900 miles, which is about the distance from New York City to Orlando. It was too consistent for chance. In the late 1800s, geologists started mapping rock types carefully. They walked riverbanks and chipped samples. Again and again, the same thing showed up. West of the line, the rock was hard and tight. East of it, the rock was loose and layered. You could feel it with a hammer. That was the first solid evidence. Next, survey teams measured elevation using chains and levels. They mapped how fast rivers dropped from hill country to the sea. The graphs showed a smooth slope through soft ground and a sharp bend upward at the boundary. The river profile looked like a knee. That bend happened at the same place as the rock change. This meant water behavior was controlled by the ground below, not random events. But the real proof came from drilling. Universities like Virginia Tech and UNC drilled core samples straight down across the boundary. They pulled up long cylinders of rock about the width of a coffee can. Some holes went hundreds of feet deep, like drilling down the height of a 40-story building. The cores told the story layer by layer. 
downstream cores showed sand and clay stacked like a cake. It was easy to crumble. Upstream cores showed solid rock formed deep underground that was hard to break. The boundary zone showed cracked rock and sharp transitions. That is where rivers struggled. Different teams drilled in different states and all found the same pattern. Same boundary, same change, and same result. That closed the argument. The fall line was real and measurable. Once that was settled, geologists asked why that boundary is there at all. The answer reaches back into deep time. Long before humans or dinosaurs, the ocean covered much of the East Coast. Sand and mud settled on the bottom for ages. Then the ocean pulled back. The land rose slowly and rivers formed. Farther inland, the ground was older. That rock formed deep underground when continents crashed together and pushed the land up. Over time, weather wore those mountains down. Rain and wind shaved them lower but the hard rock remained near the surface. When rivers crossed from the old hard ground onto the younger soft ground, they exposed that boundary. The fall line is an old shoreline written into the earth. This explains why the line stays in the same place for millions of years. Soft ground wears away faster while hard ground resists. Over time, the boundary slowly moves west as erosion eats at the hard rock but that movement is slower than grass grows. Engineers estimate it moves inches over thousands of years. On human time scales, it is fixed. That is why towns built there in the 1700s are still there now. The ground hasn't changed under them. You see this same pattern in Virginia, the Carolinas, and Georgia. In North Carolina, towns like Roanoke Rapids sit right on the line. Near Raven Rock State Park, the Cape Fear River shows the same change, smooth below and rocky above. One strong proof came from old shipping logs. Historians matched colonial records with modern maps. Captains wrote where they had to stop and where cargo moved to wagons. Those spots line up with the fall line almost perfectly. Written complaints match rock maps. Another proof came from old mills. Archaeologists mapped hundreds of mill sites that cluster tightly along the boundary. They sit right where water dropped just enough to turn wheels. A 10-foot drop can run a mill all day, which is like having free electricity forever. Builders didn't know geology, but they knew power. They followed gravity, and gravity followed rock. Modern flood studies added more proof. Engineers measure water energy using flow speed. Energy spikes at the boundary because water drops over hard ground. The math matches the idea perfectly. No other explanation fits all the data. This understanding changes how we see regional history. For a long time, people said inland towns fell behind because they missed opportunities. That story puts blame on people, but geology stacked the deck early. Transportation stopped at the boundary and industry started there. Coastal ports focused on shipping while inland areas stayed rural. When railroads arrived, they followed existing towns. Tracks connect places that are already busy. Geography made the first move and everything else followed. This also explains why similar patterns don't show up everywhere. In places like northern India, the land is flat for hundreds of miles. Rivers don't hit hard ground suddenly, so trade centers form deep in the interior. This wasn't because people were smarter, but because the ground allowed it. Same humans, different land, different outcome. Understanding this removes personal blame. You didn't choose where the rock boundary ran. It was set long before people. Geography is permanent on human timescales. Jobs move and factories close, but the land stays put. Most people never hear this explanation. They see decline and assume failure, but the ground tells a different story. Once you learn it, you see patterns everywhere. Cities lining up, rivers misbehaving, and roads following old paths all trace back to that boundary under your feet. The mystery is solved. Rivers drop, because hard ground stops erosion. 
Towns formed because boats had to stop. Industry grew because water fell there. The evidence lines up from rock samples, river profiles, old maps, and modern measurements. Different teams from various universities got the same results. The case is closed. The fall line is a rule that shaped lives. It explains why regions look the way they do today. It wasn't because of bad choices, but because of stone and gravity. The land wrote the plan long ago and people followed it without knowing. Now you know why it is this way and the pattern makes sense. The question is answered because the ground explains it all. Geography is permanent on human timescales. These ancient geological forces were active hundreds of millions of years ago and remain active today. Industries change and populations shift, but the underlying landscape stays constant. The geographic patterns we see today were determined by ancient forces beyond human control. This is not about human decisions. It is about physics written in stone. The mystery is solved. Core samples and radioactive dating proved this formation occurred through continental collision, creating the boundary that still controls how water flows and where development occurs today. Next time you see this pattern, you're witnessing that ancient geological force in action. The same processes that shaped the land millions of years ago are still working today, just too slowly to notice in a human lifetime. Understanding these permanent geological forces helps explain why certain patterns exist in the landscape. The geographic features we observe are not random. They are the direct result of ancient processes that science has now fully documented and explained. The case is closed.